Thank you. The only difficulty I had in preparing the talk was in trying to gauge the level of expertise already present in the audience. I have no doubt that if we were all beamed off to another world and asked to explain the events of the Second World War, we could, between us, produce a very detailed reconstruction of those years. But I expect it would be a team effort. We don't all know everything. Each of us has chosen his own level of expertise, whether it is the Eighth Army, the, uh, or the U-boats, or the kamikaze. The trick for all of us is to explain what we know in a way which neither overly simplifies nor, through complexity, alienates his listeners. My father was a professor of geophysics involved in proving the theory of plate tectonics. I still remember him curling up on Saturday mornings and reading books like Plasto Explosivity of Marine Basal Sediments. Um, <laughs> most, of, most of his published papers began with the words, it is common knowledge that, after which I understood nothing. So if in the next hour I wander too far in one direction or another, I do hope you'll accept my apology in advance. In order to understand the Waffen SS, which was the combat arm of the SS organization, it is important to have an overall grasp of the organization as a whole. It's also important not just to understand what these men, and in some cases women, did, but why they did it, and why they joined the SS instead of the Army, the Navy, or the Air Force, and why they believed they were right in doing so. The SS represents one of the murkiest realms of study for any historian or military enthusiast. Not to study this organization, or to dismiss it out of hand simply as madness or evil, or any of those sweeping terms which blur rather than cr uh, clarify any real distinction between the SS and other participants in military conflict before, during, and after the Second World War, is the surest guarantee that these events will one day be repeated. This is a tidy rationale for delving into a study of the SS, but I must confess, it is not the reason I began this study. Uh, it doesn't look like it, but this is filled with water. Um, <laughs> I don't need to fortify myself for the, for the minutes that lie ahead. <laughs> Before becoming a geophysicist, my father was a javelin thrower for the British Olympic team in the 1950s. I'm the shortest male in my family in three generations. My father was six foot seven. And when he came to America, he fell in love with the place. But he also fell in love with my mother, who was a swimmer on the team. They decided to get married. But in the late 50s, in Britain, that wasn't as easy as you might think, because they were from very different social groups. My father's family were all soldiers, all members of the South Wales borderers, as all good Welshmen are, and my mother's family were wealthy. They had butlers and maids. My grandma never drove a car. She would just stick her head out the window and shout to the gardener, McGregor, come forward, and McGregor the gardener would come <laughs> bulleting down the garden path and drive my grandma off in their wood-panelled Morris Minor. <laughs> You'd think that it would be the wealthy side of my family, my side, that would have objected. But in that typical blue-collar arrogance, it wasn't. It was my father's side that objected to the marriage. The only way they could stay together was to emigrate, which they did. My father never got over the slight of having been pushed aside by his own family. And I think as a way to, somehow as a way to ease his own conscience, he decided to send me away to these very strict schools when I was seven. Um, my father was teaching in Rhode Island at the time and they used to put me at the age of seven on a plane in Logan Airport and fly me over to England where I um, was a student at this place called the Dragon School which if you've seen Harry Potter is about the same except the candles don't float. Um, <laughs> I then went on to a school called Eton, where we wore, just this could sum it all up, every day, if you think I'm dressed to the nines now, wing collar, white bow tie, waistcoat, a habit I still haven't kicked, and uh, a tailcoat, like Arthur Fiedler. Um, <laughs> the reason I'm telling this story is because at the age of 16 in England, you begin to specialise. I was a language specialist. You can become a modern language specialist or an ancient language specialist. Now, I'd done 12 years of Latin, but now it was time to choose, either Ancient Greek or German. <laughs> I had no particular love of German, but an even less 
um, respect, an even smaller respect for ancient Greek. So I chose German. Part of that, uh, part of that education means being sent away to the, to the country in which you will study your language. I was sent to a city, a town called Bad Gordesberg, which is outside Bonn. And I was with a family um, who were Prussian aristocrats. They had fled uh, from the east um, in 45. There were three brothers. And the story they told me was that the two brothers fled and the third brother was last seen standing on the roof of his house firing at the Russian tanks with a shotgun. Um, they lived in this extraordinarily modern building, modern house, except the first thing your eye fastened on when you walked into the room was a suit of armor. And I found myself thinking, of all the things you could take with you when you are fleeing from the Russians, wouldn't you take paintings? Wouldn't you take valuables? No, they took a suit of armor. And this, in a way, summed up the family, but not as entirely as I had thought. Any of you who've been exchange students, if the experience went well, know that it leaves a lasting and positive impact. I had for a long time not been part of a complete family group. My father died at the age of 43, um, so I hadn't had a father figure since I was 12. And nor had I sat down to dinner very often as a family group. What I'm getting at is that this time I spent in Germany wasn't simply to learn the language, it became my first real experience of being in a family as a teenager at all. Three days before I was due to go back to school in Britain, the father called me into his study and he pointed to the door, meaning I should shut it behind me. I lived in mortal fear that I would somehow, I would somehow tread over some in invisible line and create some, some, some faux pas that would be inexcusable and try as I might that somehow I had, I had interrupted the flow of German culture with my British arrogance or whatever it was. <laughs> so I sat down on the couch and the man began to pace before me. And he said, I'm going to tell you something I have not told my own sons. He had two sons, both about my age. And he said, when I was your age, and at that age I had just turned 17, I was inducted into the Waffen-SS. He only told me one story but one way or another, it changed my life. The story he told me was that he had been member of the 12th SS Panzer Division, which was known as the Hitler Jugend Division, mostly made up of 17 and 18 year olds. They'd gone into the Normandy battlefield with a contingent of 6,750 men and 200 tanks. One month later, they fell back from the Falaise Gap with 600 men and no tanks. They were refitted and sent up against the Americans once again in the Battle of the Bulge. It was in this battle that the young man took part. He said that after two days of fighting, his platoon, which was called a rot, had been reduced from 14 to 4. He was gathered together in what the Germans call Kampfgruppen. These are sort of um, uh, decimated platoons which are sort of packed together. And he was told he you know, came to the edge of a forest across which you have to imagine a field that it would take you about four or five minutes to cross on a flat run, maybe a bit less. At the end of that were three or four houses which had been taken over by the Americans. An officer told them you will advance across this field in extended formation. He said, if I see anybody's face, that is, if anybody turns around, the man said, I will shoot you myself. By this time, the men knew that they were part of a diversionary attack. The main attack was coming in from the side with mechanized infantry.